folks, you are back on the air with Dr. Bones in the Nutsack. <laughs> Coming to you on KKUM Radio, Tallahassee's hottest classic rock station. Now the Nutsack is off-site having his Nutsack stretched. <laughs> so it's all Dr. Bones today for you cowardly listeners out there in Buttsville. <laughs> and we've got quite the exciting announcement for you today. We have finally finally receive the attention we deserve. Oh, yeah. And the Dr. Bones and the Nutsack show is going national. <laughs> That's right, we've been acquired by now. Let me make sure I get this right. The Butu Inc. Studios. <laughs> now, I don't know a lot about Butu Inc., but what I do know is that those fat, drunken slobs have given me enough money to buy several hookers for this weekend's fart games. <laughs> taking place at the beautiful Wetumpka Coliseum, where I'll be signing autographs this weekend from 3 to 3.45 p.m., and that alone makes this new network okay in my book. <laughs> but I want to know what you think out there, listeners, and we've got Candy on line one. Candy, you are on the air. Tell me, how hot are your hot boobs, Candy? <laughs> oh, Dr. Bones, I wish you could see them, because they are a perfect 10. Candy, don't get me all worked up. I have a show to do here. What do you think of these guys at Boo2 Inc.? Now, I'm told there are three boob tube boys, Brian, Spencer, and Van, and I frankly don't know anything about them. Who is the hottest boob tube boy in your opinion? Mm, oh. They are all hot, Dr. Bones. I want to take all three of those hunky men and show them what candy tastes like. Oh, me so horny. Me love you long time. Candy, you're making me blush. All right, Candy, lightning round here. I'm going to ask you three questions you answer as fast as you can, okay? Which boob tube boy would you call to deliver to you a pizza? I want my extra-large pizza with extra sausage to be delivered to me by Spencer. I'd even show my appreciation with an extra special tip. Candy, you vixen. Okay, next question. Your cable goes out. <coughs> Which boob tube boy do you call to come fix it? Van's so handy. I'd let him jostle my rabbit ears all night long. <coughs> Candy, I gotta tell you, Dr. Bones is starting to live up to his name here. All right, final question. Which boob tube boy do you think would absolutely wreck your toilet? There's no doubt about this one, Dr. Bones. It's Brian, and only Brian. I'd let him ride my porcelain pony. <laughs> All right, Candy, shut up. But before I kick your ass to the curb, I want you to tell me what station rocks your vagina harder than any other station. station. KKUM, your one stop for classic rock from 1974 to 1982. That was Candy out of White Springs, Florida. I'll bet she has some boobs. <laughs> oh, of course, if the nutsack were here, he'd say that famous line of his and say it with me together, folks. Oh, I suck my butt! I want to thank all of you puke brains out there for tuning in to the Dr. Bones and Nutsack show, but it's time to pass the torch off to our new friends, the Boob Two Boys. And if there's one thing I can say for sure about them, it's that I like one third of their name. Take it away, you wieners. It's time for more boob tubes. I'm Spencer Hendricks. I will be taking you, whether you want to come or not, along for the journey. <laughs> How do you spelling come in that sentence? <laughs> mm, well, I better not ask that just yet. So we're going to be talking about silk stockings, and I'm going to start by introducing the people who are going to talk about silk stockings with me. Let's see, Brian, what do you think about silk? Silk is a smooth fabric. I don't That's true. personally do you I have any, think, own do you have any, any feelings on it. I don't think I own any silk clothing items. Maybe there's like, I own two ties for some reason, and one of them might be silk. I don't know. Okay. Well, that, that's Brian Vaughn. And now we've got Van Lee. Van, how do you feel about stockings? And I, I do mean stockings, how it's spelled in the show. <laughs> how do you feel about stockings? How do you feel about leering at people through windows? <laughs> and I mean... potentially threatening them and... <laughs> I haven't been caught yet, so <laughs> I guess I'm pro stockings at this point. Okay. No, but stockings, S T O C K I N G S, I like because I have the bad knees and everything. I like compression socks; they make my legs and ankles oh, okay. and feet feel better. Do you have so any stocks silk could socks? Work. I don't. Silk wise, I like silk sheets, but like silk underwear is a bad idea. I don't understand why anybody does. It's that. It's a good concept. It just 
it has some downfalls. Mm-hmm. For I feel sure. like your your stuff would just be sliding around. It That's the problem. I kind of yes. like that because I don't want a lot of pushback from my underwear. <laughs> oh no, I want it. Verbal <clears throat> pushback, <laughs> like it argues with you. They haven't invented that yet, but they could. <laughs> I don't think I fit the same anymore. Whoa, look here, Haynes. <laughs> I've heard enough of your shit. I think that gives you, the listener, a pretty good idea of what you're in for. And <laughs> <laughs> what about silk shoes, guys? Do you have any of those? Those would probably <laughs> just fall right apart. What about the Silk Road? You ever done some trading on that? <laughs> I used to eat at a Chinese restaurant called Silk Road. Is it was still amazing. There? I don't think so. I don't think so either, but yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. It, it was, was good. good. I, I loved it. That was like one of my favorite places to go as a child. Nothing like Chinese. You just unleash a little kid in a Chinese food buffet. <laughs> Only good things can happen. <laughs> right after you get them out of your trunk, if it's Spencer's case. <laughs> so a general overview of Silk Stockings before we get into our first episode this week, which is season one, episode 13, Shock Jock. It ran from 1991 to 1999. That's eight seasons, 176 episodes. And this good part was God. This part was interesting to me. I don't, did you guys know it went on that long? I did not. I knew it went on for a few years. I, I knew it aired for a few years. I didn't know how many new episodes they had. That blows my mind that it was that long. I guess I didn't consider the episode count. I knew. Yeah, I mean, you, since you only picked from season one and two, I didn't know if you had seen that it, you had many more seasons to choose from I or not. I did see that. However, that was an intentional decision because this is kind of was the show's rise to popularity right. run. And they replaced both of the leads. Mm-hmm. Right. Which I, I will discuss, actually. I, I didn't go too deep into that because uh, the show doesn't deserve that much research, but I did find out a little bit about that, and I can see why you did what you did. This was pretty cool. We're going to do a little bit of, I guess, um, cable television history right now. Hell briefly. yeah. CBS actually unleashed this. And I know <laughs> what you're going to say, and I love it. In a bunch of... <laughs> I don't think I'm going to, I think I'm going to let you down. I'm just going to talk about. Well, I'm going to talk about it if you don't. Please be my guest. Well, I hope you do then. I, you're very excited. About well, it. I am, I am ripe with anticipation. I don't know anything about what either. Well, person. CBS <laughs> decided they wanted to switch things up in 1991. They used to have like just their late night programming, which was the Pat Sajak show and stuff like that. And uh, that, what, that what? He had yeah. another show? He had a show. He got canceled. It didn't work. <laughs> They're Wheel like, of misfortune. <laughs> <laughs> he had a talk show and they, they did like game shows and stuff like that. So they decided they wanted to try something a little different in 1981, and it was called Crime Time After Prime Time. That's what I was getting at, which is my favorite thing. That is so cool. Crime Time After Prime Time. Yeah, what a fucking title. I would have been super excited. And they replaced the Pat Sajak show with this, so that's just win-win. Everybody wins in this situation. So actually, Silk Stockings wasn't the first choice to fill that slot. They did a whole season of Fly By Night, I think it was called. Um, the can- Rush song? A Canadian wilderness, like... Um, well, yeah, Canadian yeah, wilderness. We're there. Some sort of Canadian adventure show is all I could tell. It was one season, and they pulled the plug on that shit. They kept, you know, they kept crime time after prime time, and they were like, we need something else in place of... I, and I could be getting the name wrong, I don't care. But they that's when they introduced Silk Stockings, which aired on Thursday nights or we Friday mornings. We need a show mornings. that'll make you afraid and give you a boner. <laughs> That was the plan going into Silk Stockings, I assume. They succeeded. <laughs> so, yeah, and I actually did make a note good for me. It is Fly By Night, so I'm not going to be offending any of the creators of that show that only lasted one season. So Crime Time <laughs> After Prime Time didn't last much longer than Fly By Night. It only, it only went a couple years, and then they got some deal with David Letterman, and that was the end. Then they flipped it and it had to become prime time after crime time because there was no more crime time. <laughs> yeah, David Letterman took over that whole scheduling block for, of course, years and years and years. So Crime Time After Prime Time was very short-lived, and that's pretty cool. It was just a couple years where CBS got a little dark at night, like, you know, physically, too. Which, that is interesting, because CBS is traditionally seen as the more boilerplate, boring channel to me. Yeah. Like, when you see CBS shows, it's Big Bang Theory. Yeah. It's stuff like that. It's the Dick Van Dyke. What, what's the thing I just talked to you about the other night? Diagnosis Murder. Right, it's shows right. like that. I think that when I think of Silk Stockings, I think of more like USA Up All Night. Right. Or yeah. And that's, of course, where it went. Cinemax for kids. Yeah. USA picked up Silk Stockings after CBS had to do away with all their shows and their crime time after prime time. So it spent most of its run on USA. That's where it been. And then USA canceled it in 1999 on its own. They probably would have kept running with it, but USA said that's enough. So it stopped in, in 99. It did 
get nominated for a Primetime Emmy Award. It obviously didn't win it. It got nominated once. That was the only award that it even got nominated for the entire It's not a decorated show is the point. Is it, is it a titled award, like most, Best Blank or whatever? Most Palm Trees or something? Yeah, like I don't. Sexiest. It just says Primetime Emmy, which it wasn't even Primetime, so okay. it doesn't make sense. But that's what IMDb said. <laughs> most color wardrobe. <laughs> just most. That's the basic rundown of it. But yeah, we only saw, we're only watching the CBS era, so... USA, whatever happened with that, we're not going to be talking about. I bet, I bet this was its peak. I bet. Oh, I'm sure. So we're getting the good stuff in the silk stockings and this, both of our episodes we'll be talking about just so you guys know that are listening. This, this is the crime time after prime time era. So that's, we're going to, we're going to kind of be a part of that. The best era. And also the show was created by hero of hero the of boot two boys he is a hall of famer steven cannell aka cool. the guy who created 21 jump street and renegade yes somehow i missed that three-time creator on the show that. i don't that, think anybody else no. has more than one no chance also should we tell the listeners it's a good time if you haven't already clap your hands so those lights turn down low <laughs> maybe light a candle maybe some incense maybe loosen your top button maybe get a glass of wine just kind of be a little carefree before you listen to the rest of this episode. Definitely. Up your saxophone. <laughs> yeah, there's there's going to be some it's going to be some interesting conversations we're going to have to have. Real quickly, the cast and it's it's not much because it's mostly Rob <laughs> Estes, which is Sergeant Chris Lorenzo. He was in a hundred episodes. Mitzi Capture. I don't really know how to say that. Capture is how it looks, but it's probably Capture or something like that. She is Sergeant Rita Lee Lance. She was in a hundred and one episodes because she was in one more episode than Chris. Because they had him die after mm-hmm. they got married in season five. And then she was in one more episode to indicate that she's moving on with her life. And she ne- neither one of them came back after season also five. Also really bums me out. I really grew to love Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should be happy for him that he eventually did get Rita in the end. We don't get for to see For a day. That. <laughs> I'm glad he died. <laughs> <laughs> he is kind of a douche. I don't know. He's All right. I'm going to do one little bit here about Chris Estes. Rob Estes. Rob Estes, excuse me. Rob Estes. I didn't think you could make me say Lorenzo Lamas is nuanced and subtle as an actor until I saw, I saw Rob Estes in this show. How does he have the career he has? He's <laughs> I, not even like a hunk either. I don't think he's that. Like he doesn't fit that mold of the attractive hunk that goes right. on all these Melrose Place shows. He just, I don't get it. I don't get any bit of this. So I mostly agree with you here. I do think he is a better actor than Lorenzo Lamas. I don't. I sure don't. <laughs> it's, and, not, it's not terribly far apart. He <laughs> might be a little better. It's not what he does not read lines wooden. He reads them. That's true. Just off a little bit, maybe. He reads them like he's not aware of what words are exactly. That's just it. It's like reading a foreign language. He can read the foreign language. He might not internalize yeah. what the words are, except this is his native language. Right. I like Well, that. we don't know that. Sure. I think maybe his native language is just little hand signals that he makes while surfing. <laughs> I like, and I'm going to talk about this as we get into it, how the emotion will surge into some of his lines out of nowhere, out of <laughs> absolutely nowhere. Suddenly he's just very intense and very passionate that's one of and he's it turns very the method. scene on a dime it's like whoa okay i guess we're going for that here but <laughs> he also yeah. does that thing that happened back in this era when the actual frame size of television was that 4 yeah. HI. it was yeah. smaller not as widescreen so if there's a scene between two people and it's one camera they have to get right up against one another mm-hmm. and that happens like a dozen times in these episodes where Rob Estes is basically breathing another human being. He's that close. I think he liked that. Oh, I'm sure. And it should be noted right away, Rob Estes in this show uh, playing Chris, he is always wearing very bright colored suit jackets and ties. And he also is a bit of a pioneer with his haircut, Mm -hmm. which is kind of a spiked up uh, van. I believe you have a term for this. I don't that you have pioneered. A... Oh, I see. What years you're and years hair. ago. Yes, and explain <laughs> that term for the for the audience. This became a fad in the '90s, where everyone would have this haircut. Probably started about '97 or '8. Yeah, and basically, in my opinion, it looked like you just pressed your face up against a window, and then your hair stuck where it was, like sticking up. What I want to say about his hair, and, and credit goes to Katie for this. We were trying to picture, figure out what it looked like, mm-hmm. and she said it looks like in that episode of The Office when Creed tries to pretend to be oh, younger, and he puts the printer ink in his hair to be jet black. <laughs> That's what he looks it, like. It does look dyed black, and it, but it is spiked up, which mm-hmm. in early, I did not think of as an early to mid-90s thing. I was, especially when, by contrast, most of the characters in the show, whether they're men or women, they have perms. <laughs> they do, Yes. <laughs> 
No, that's actually true. I, I didn't realize that considering how early this would have been. This yeah, this would have been early nineties still, so that's true. He was a he was a little bit ahead of his time. Fashion icon, guys. Orange blazer spiked up hair. There were a few other main characters we don't we don't see, but the rest of the show they appeared quite a bit. Someone named Captain Harry Lipschitz, played by Charlie Bell, was in 129 episodes. The new main characters were Detective Sergeant Cassandra St. John. God, that's a long name. Played by Janet Gunn. That was 67 episodes. Name works really well for the role. <laughs> and then Chris Potter was Detective Sergeant Tom Ryan. I'm assuming those two were the main characters the rest of the way. He was in 66. Fred Malamed, you know that the guy that does the the deep voice that was in like in a, in a world, the movie with Lake Bell. Oh yeah, yeah. He's yeah. like the big hairy bald guy that has a deep voice. He he is an announcer, I, I assume, on the radio station in fifty four uh, episodes. Wow. wow. Okay. Yeah. So I was I was shocked at that. I was like, I can't. I, you recognize his face as soon as you see it, like in the cast. I was like, what did he play in this? And I think he's just like used generically and. On their fake radio station or whatever. I don't know. I don't know if there's a lot of radio referenced in the show, but he's an announcer. In I wonder 54. if this show uses the framing of the radio station a lot. That's what I was thinking is they must. To, to show events or maybe even, yeah, maybe even just explain to us a crime happened and then it kind of sets up the cops. Somehow. But yeah, they, they found a way to use in 54 episodes unless I misread that, but I prefer to think it happened that way. It's just random cutaways that have nothing <laughs> to do with the plot. So I think that covers the basics there. I, I had a note at the end that we already got into about how about how they give they give Chris and Rita their their wedding and then kill Chris the very next episode. So that's the, the original red wedding. That's the basic premise. As I mentioned, we're doing starting with this week. We're doing season one, episode thirteen, Shock Jock. The actual synopsis is when the live-in girlfriend of a popular and obnoxious radio personality is killed. Rita and Chris investigate the disturbed fan who admits to the murder. Now, I was telling Brian this before we recorded, but when I see Shock Jock, I only know of one person, and that's Howard Stern. So in my notes, the synopsis is just that Howard Stern makes a guest appearance. That's all I've got in here. <laughs> and that's the whole episode. <laughs> there were some extra cast members in this one that I guess weren't in any others or very many others that yeah, I'll talk about because of quick. Howard Stern, there's Beetlejuice <laughs> there... <laughs> and Robin Gibbons. <laughs> Jack Feldman. Who, Baba who, Booey. <laughs> whom Van did dress as tonight, mm -hmm. is played by a guy named Roger Bumpass. <laughs> yes! I'm so glad that you brought that up. I'm sure it's Bumpus, but... I A.K.A. the voice of Squidward from Spongebob. What? Yeah, Roger Bumpass had a, <laughs> a long real career. career. Is that what mm. we're supposed to call him, though? Ro Bump Roger Bumpass? For, well, it's in my Boob Two Boys contract that if <laughs> ASS appears in any word or name consecutively, you say ass. Mm -hmm. Then there's Kim Morgan Green, who's Melissa Cassidy. She's in like six or seven, and I think is kind of a halfway love interest of Chris. And you've got Marta Dubois, who plays the crazed Helen McCabe. We'll, uh, we'll be talking a lot about Helen, not I, so much about Melissa. I thought Melissa. she was very down to earth and stable, but okay. <laughs> Seemed great. Uh, <laughs> do you guys agree that we're not going to have to talk about Melissa that much? She was pretty boring. No. Which one was Melissa? Melissa, works Melissa was the, the, That answers the question. <laughs> Melissa's the radio station one that Chris oh, yeah, had yeah. a thing for. The other girlfriend yeah, that's yeah. just kind of there. The, yeah. Probably what what television shows often have because we know Chris and Rita are yes, they're police eventually. partners they're going to get together but you need some bumps along the way some other love interests yeah it, it takes a while and then the other person gets I shot I am now I'm now I've made it this far in without being absorbed by Van's very very sleazy radio attire right now he's wearing <laughs> I'm going to describe it we're going to put photos up on the Instagram and the Twitter at boob 2 boys for both but Van is wearing a sweater, the collar's coming out the top. How would you describe the ponytail? Glorious. It's like multi-tiered. I mean, look, I saw a man who I aspired to be <laughs> right. in Squidward, and I said, that's it, that's what I'm going to do. I was disappointed because I didn't actually have a button-up black dress shirt, <laughs> because that's the most obnoxious color of dress shirt you can have. Yeah. So I had Hard to kind of switch it a bit, but you'll see. You know, you can do a black dress shirt depending on the pants, really. Yeah. Get gray pants. They I also, tried that. But they get disgusting. Black shirts, black or white shirts look disgusting. Especially like, I like to roll around on the ground before a formal event. Sure. And then what am I supposed to do then? It shows up really easily on a black shirt. And what are you supposed to do? Not roll around <laughs> on the floor? I know. It's the only thing that both eases my nerves and gets me sent to jail. The last extra person in this is Beth Chamberlain, who plays the sculptor. <laughs> the sculptor, oh, Barbara Dunham, who gives him the big lead at later on in the episode. Very small part, yet very, very memorable scene. Also big parts in that scene, too. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, they sure accentuated it a lot with the, with the camera there. So that's the, uh, that's the extra people that we didn't talk about in the onset there. And it's time to get started with the cold open. 
which is an awful blowhard talking on the radio. It's in a, in a voiceover. You can tell right away this is the shock jock and he is awful. That's about all you really need to know. He, do you guys want to talk about the content of his words here that we see as the episode starts? I can tell you that Mexican food, flatulence, and small boobs on fat women are what tee him off. Yeah, I can tell you that I bet all you guys sit at home watching the stupid tube sucking down pork rinds and beer. <laughs> Which, absolutely true. He's got me nailed right there. The stupid tube, boys. <laughs> also, by the way, Roger Bump ass, he, might, he manages to say both boob and tube in this episode. He does. You know, I was thinking about point. that. I, Oh, because I was listening to a podcast the other day. They were, it's new, and they were talking about what they want to call their fans. And so this this podcast is split ends. It's a football podcast, man. You should listen to it. You'd love it. I'm good. <laughs> and uh, and they said that they came up with splitties for their fans. So I was thinking, man, we can't do that. We can't be boobies. Like, that can't be our fan. <laughs> I we, mean, we could. We could be tubies. What about little tubers? <laughs> little tubers. I'm, I'm good boobers. with that. <laughs> little boobers. Yeah, we need to come up with that sometime. So the main thing here, the voiceover is is present and impossible not to notice, but what we get is the very slowly creeping murderer into the bathroom of a very beautiful woman who is rubbing a bar of soap all over her body. And but right before that, she was just kind of yeah, rubbing her legs something. while wearing lingerie. I thought maybe those were stockings and like that was the point of the show or whatever, but no, she's she kind of disrobes and goes into the shower and smashes a bar of soap all over her and <laughs> <laughs> the camera zooms way in. It wanted, it wished so bad it wasn't TV 14, so it could have just been porn. You could just tell the way the camera shot that scene. They did everything they could. They went as close as they could and, and kind of showed just the curves. And they, they knew they couldn't get away with much, but they tried, is the sense that I got from that. So we get to see her wash for a little bit. And then the killer comes in. He's wearing a mask. He's got a silencer and his gun. He shoots her through the shower door. <laughs> I would think it'd be easier just to open it up and do that. But he shoots her through the glass. There's blood everywhere. They show the bar of the soap going down the drain, just like Psycho. And then the blood goes down. Yeah. Hitchcock directed this, too. Yeah, there are so many little similarities between... Also, just like Psycho, this was partially based on Ed Gein. <laughs> <laughs> now, one thing I want to point out is, and we learn, this is not a surprise, that this is the wife or girlfriend of the shock jock. Yes. And while she's bathing, before she realizes the killer's there and he kills her, She's listening to him on the radio. Yeah, she loves this guy. So this posits the question, do you think Katie ever showers and listens to the boob tube? Boys? Probably. I would imagine. I mean, who doesn't? She listens to podcasts, but not the boob tube boys in the shower. <laughs> I actually find to your point. I actually find podcasts and showers to be uh, awkward. I, I can't do I can't listen well. It's, enough. A, it's not. Yeah. And you can't really put in like earbuds while you're showering. So, I, yeah, I, I've never found a place to put my podcast playing device mm -hmm. to where I can actually hear it. So no, I, I'm not a shower podcast guy. This is, this is the cold open. As the, as Van said, you know, that's the, that's the shock jocks live in girlfriend who's getting murdered here. We don't know that yet, but that is who that is. This, the, he's also like, we get kind of the, as Spencer said, he's saying all this gross stuff while we're seeing the murder kind of in voiceover form. Mm -hmm. Same time. There's the, this is the first time of several in the episode where we're supposed to hate this shock jock because he's terrible and sexist and gross, where he's randomly extremely progressive. It happens later in it the episode, too. It happens several and I times. I love it. And the first one is he starts talking about, like, quit giving all your labor and time to, like, corporate fat cats. Mm -hmm. Go on strike. And at this point, I'm like, who do I trust? Yeah. Him? Yeah, it is a little bit. It, it's, it's, it's misleading. Honestly. Yeah, he's he's this is a complicated character, Roger Bumpass. <laughs> I will call you out, though. You said uh, fat corporate fat cats. Yeah. I believe he said corporate fat heads. Oh, I'm sorry. But yeah. the, I was very close. You got the vibe. I'll yeah. give you that. Yeah. So from here, we go into the intro, and I don't like intros, but you guys do, so I'm, I trust you guys are going to tell me all about this it. This is one of the best intros I've ever <laughs> seen in my life. I actually have a note, leave the intro to the experts, so I'm going <laughs> to step aside here. I'm going to let you guys tell me what you saw. It is a good six and a half minutes long. I'll give it that. <laughs> Which I wrote it's a note. It's a prog intro. That's another note I put is, you know, this is a really long intro, but I don't mind. It's less of the show to watch. <laughs> so go ahead. Go ahead. Very intro. true. So what happens in that intro, Brian? Well, first off, you heard it in the uh, after, well, first off, you heard a, a very real radio clip. <laughs> To start our show and then after that you heard the silk stockings theme the song rules it has a lot of screen like soulful and sultry chanting and that dun 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 part and we see a lot of stuff in the intro mostly glistening bodies there's a tarantula mm -hmm. at one point silhouettes that kiss each other there's a sea dew a sniper there's police lights there's horse riding uh the sense of investigation 
I mean, there's just so much going on that it this six and a half minutes really breezes by. And you get real rock hard from it because of the heart. Oh, yeah. Because, so again, everyone's sweaty. The tarantula is wearing a thong and he's yeah. sweating. The hottest tarantula I've ever seen in my life. It's the tarantula in silk stockings. <laughs> That's what everyone remembers about the show. So, uh, yeah, the intro had, had its own section in my notes, but we do have to, let's move past that. The opening scene now, the actual show finally gets to begin here. We've got the crime scene. We get to meet Chris and Rita. I didn't know who they were yet, so I've, I, my notes are very generic. I've just got male, female, and things like, and ponytail guy, because, you know, I don't know for sure who he is. But we, this is where you figure out, this is Shock Jock's home, this is Shock Jock's girlfriend, and his name is Jack Fellman. So he bump ass played Roger by bump Roger Bumpass. Bump Roger yes. Bumpass. And while the police are combing over the crime scene to start the show here and we meet all these characters, we have another voiceover waxing poetic about the invention of radio and how it was intended. And I'm not really sure. Like I didn't really have a goal, I don't think, but that is how they open it up while the police are combing through it. I think that this radio host, the the woman that we hear speaking here, is definitely supposed to be the counterpoint to Jack Fellman of this is a reasonable person who doesn't believe radio should be you was invented or should be used simply to draw a pointless reaction. Yeah, she says something along the lines of when when Marconi invented the radio. <laughs> it's very dramatic. Which is a lot different than the I get mad when boobs are small yeah. <laughs> that we just heard. I imagine her as like the Delilah kind of character. Well, maybe you know she I'm is. About? Yeah. Oh, I, we re- I think we talked about Delilah recently in context of Frasier. But yeah, she's like, do you think that Marconi would have ever thought that uh, shock jock would ever exist? And I posit that I think Marconi had that foresight, and he's like, I want to hear Beetlejuice, so I'm yeah. going to make sure this happens. Marconi would be loudly yelling Baba Booey in the 90s, <laughs> just like a lot of other dirty people who lived in New York. So as I mentioned, uh, I, I want to call him, I, there's so many things I want to call him, but I'm going to try to get his name, Fellman. We're going to call We're going to try to call him Fellman. Okay, we're going to do our best from now on. And it is Jack. I might have called him Jeff because I wasn't sure what his Bump name ass. was. Jack, <laughs> Jack Fellman. And he sure, the second you see, you set your eyes on him, you're like, okay, this guy's a villain, right? Like, yeah. literally, yeah. this is the and villain. You, I mean, from the, he is just pure dripping. He's, the bump ass is having a time with this role. Yes, like, he is. He's really getting into character. I also, his ponytail is pulled really tightly yeah. and it looks mm-hmm. painful. Rita's questioning him right away and you can tell she doesn't like him. At this point, there's no reason to believe he's involved and he's, he's acting sad. He's acting shocked. and Kind of. Yeah, I mean, he basically all he says is he came home at noon, found her with her eyes still open like she was asking for help. So much blood. He, he, she's like, do you, I, we don't have to do this right now. No, I, I want to. I, I, it's going to help me get through it if I talk about her. Her murder. So that that's the opening part here. He tells her, oh, you know, I'm on the radio. And she's very annoyed. She's like, yeah, I know. I, I know who you are. And she asks him, does, does any, did anyone, you know, what you always ask when someone gets murdered. So who hated this person? Who, who did this? And of course, as usual, the person they're asking who did it, no one. So we learned from Jack that no one wanted to hurt Carol. Everyone loved her. And this is gonna have to be uh it's gonna have to be a mystery because who kills somebody when there's no reason to kill them no one's got a motive he talks about how they were going to be married and they had all these big plans together the show's going national now it's all for not everything's ruined and his life is over anyway back to the radio station where i talk about tits (laughs) after rita does her initial questioning with jack here we meet chris they convene and we learn nothing was taken Although, I think there was a little line there that, Brian, you liked quite a bit. The only thing taken was her life. (laughs) But nothing else was taken. This was purely an act of murder. And Chris doesn't like Jeff. He's he's already pretty sure he doesn't like him. He he thinks he's a pig who shouldn't be on the air. Seems to think his radio show alibi is awfully convenient. I'm not sure. (laughs) I think Chris is pretty much on to him right away. Rita's going to give him a chance, but I don't think either one of them likes him. And when Rita gives him like a little rebuttal here, gives Chris a rebuttal, it really comes across as the writers would like to play devil's advocate. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you don't (laughs) believe in the First Amendment, something like (laughs) that. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't come across like Rita's character, who at the beginning seemed more skeptical, like two minutes ago when interviewing Jack. Seem more skeptical. Jack! So, <laughs> Chris tells a story real quickly here. I'll get into this and we'll move on to the next scene. Chris tells a story about why Fellman's a jackass like we don't already know. 
about how we called an assault victim in the hospital and put her on air, asked her if she had an orgasm while her face was slashed open by a can opener because she was the victim of, a, of, a, of an assault. I- she was a prostitute, too. So that was that kind of key to that was he was like, she was a sex worker who was already hurt. So she got what she deserved. And he did what, yeah, and he was awful to her. So that conversation ends with Chris muttering something about, well, at least this gives him an excuse to go to the radio station and talk to Melissa, who we mentioned up top. Melissa's very boring, but Chris likes her. He has a thing for her. And that's where he's going to go. We meet Melissa right away, right after this. She's ending her show because she's also a radio host. She works with Jack and Chris is going to do his little, he's going to investigate Jack behind his back through his co-workers to figure out if he can get some dirt on him. So there's a very awkward greeting when they meet each other. They, they kind of look at each other with desire in their eyes, and then they hug. And that happens for a bit. He tells her she's ni- she looks nice, and then it just right away, right away goes into the grisly details of the murder. <laughs> After, yeah, and the music cue also, and the lingering hug made it feel like they might just do it right then and well, there. That's, a, that's later. But they almost that, do. Yeah. <laughs> after that, though, the way he's just like, you look nice. Oh, your co-worker's girlfriend was murdered. <laughs> yeah, just he just flips it immediately. <laughs> and she's kind of like, what? But not that surprised. Carol? So, after being shocked, and, and, sh- and then not very quickly, she is recovered. She becomes aroused because Chris is playing with her ear and you know, like touching her face. Talking and more about blood of the innocent. Things take a real intimate turn here and they do kind of go at it a little while they're getting ready to, but then a beeper interrupts. It always did that in the 90s. Beepers <laughs> stopped everything from happening in the 90s. Do either of you have a beeper? No. Or a pager? No, my parents did. Justin Hughes, friend of the podcast, had one. And I remember he would look at his pager all the time and it just- <laughs> What did he think he was going to miss? I Cupcake things, I guess. <laughs> when the t- when when beepers were popular, there is no way I needed one. I right, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't busy enough to need to be or old enough. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. There's no way that I. Oh shit! I just got a call from my friend that I need to call him on the phone, talk about video games for 30 minutes. I, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with that? Mrs. Walters just paged me. I'm gonna call her back to see what grade I got on my <laughs> test. <laughs> okay, well this is a good time to go check our beepers then, and then we'll come back after this break. So this this is Melissa's beeper. She has to take the call. Chris leaves. But we're not done with the radio station. We've got to move over to Fellman's show. He is back at the station very quickly and back at work. He's in a combative conversation. I think this is what you guys were talking about. Wait, with, does um, he seem does he seem kind of forlorn, like upset? Oh, no. Oh, OK. He's totally fine. So I think this is the one you guys were talking about where he's he's fighting with the caller and he says surprisingly like liberal sounding stuff. I could be, I could be wrong, but well, no, yeah, this is the second occurrence of that, right, right, right. And you were mentioning that earlier that yeah, the, there's the first part about that, but this is this is another part where he's doing that, I believe, in this scene, I'm smoking a cigarette while recording. Hell too. yeah, I mean, and the, the, see when he's smoking a cigarette and then calling some weird immigration hound a racist on the radio. I'm, yeah, I, that's what it is. I don't know how it? I'm not supposed to Call like him a him. bigot or something. Yeah, here's what I'll say too. My mom was a smoker, and when she would call me on the phone is when she would smoke. And so- I guess that would go together. Yeah, I when I was a smoker, I would casually, like if I, which was very rare that I would get a phone call, <laughs> but I would go outside and walk. I like to walk and talk, oh, okay. so I would go outside and smoke and walk around while I talked. The If, if you ever call me and you were smoking, I would hang up on you, because the you thing hear. that happens every time is, talk, talk, talk. Yeah. I- Oh, you don't do Ooh, that in the phone, I hate though. that Although, My mom sure did. The, the Bluetooth headset thing helps with it. Oh, yeah, yeah, it certainly does. So I can't, and people who, <laughs> like now, if you're podcasting and you're cracking open a beer and smoking a cigarette, to me, it's just like- Like not I am attention. right now. I well, actually I have annoyed. three cigars hanging out of my mouth simultaneously. Yeah, but you're super cool, so. I know, I have sunglasses on. Not as cool as you, though, with your <laughs> full Roger bump-ass get-up on. <laughs> yeah, the, the bump-ass outfit right here. <laughs> that should be a compliment you can pay some, whoa, yo. Bump-ass outfit. Some bump-ass shoes. <laughs> it sounds like it came from the 90s, so <laughs> it, <does>. it fits. <laughs> so where, where Fellman's doing his show, Rita's going Rita's gonna to continue her line of questioning. And you can tell Fellman's recovered, not only by how he's acting on the show, but he immediately starts making very suggestive comments toward Rita. Oh, the other thing he does, too, and this is the ninth time this has already happened in this episode, when someone who's recording on the radio is ready to talk to someone else so they're ready to move past their segment, they do the finger across the throat yeah. slit thing. It happens I don't know, 45 times in this episode. <laughs> yeah, just over and over. Little radio insider stuff there from Silk Stockings. <laughs> just trying to make it more authentic. Can't blame him. <laughs> While Rita's talking to him, Fellman gets another call from his next person. 
And this is a regular who calls in all the time. This is the stalker type we were referring to earlier, Helen. And she is going to be pretty obvious here. She's going to lead with the fact that Carol wasn't ever going to be ever to satisfy him. I guess we never mentioned that is that is the name of the dead live-in girlfriend. She's not a live-in girlfriend anymore. She's a dead-in girlfriend. <laughs> she lives like a in the end. ground six feet under. So that, that's Carol. We'll be calling her Carol when we need to refer to the corpse at this point. Carol could never satisfy you. I love you, Jack. Something like that. So, you know, basically, that's, that's what Helen's doing. We don't see her face. We only see her from the teeth down, basically. It's like a super high close-up on Helen on the phone. And Fellman's furious, calls her a sick puppy. <laughs> you know, says, <laughs> he says, struck you know, a dagger right into her heart with that line. Says, you know what, Helen, I know we do this a lot and it's fun, you know, but this isn't the right time. My girlfriend just died. And he hangs up on that bitch. He's, he's pissed at her. Yep. This, time, this time, Helen went too far. Seems to me, boys, like we got ourselves a suspect. Oh, yeah. Dun, 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 How dun, convenient dun. that it happened right in front of Rita. So she does inquire, like, how long has she been calling? Has this been, this been going on a while? He's like, yeah, just a few months. Uh, and he kind of like, hey, do you think maybe? And she's like, yeah, we'll check in on her. Because it's always a good idea to be the one to give the police the idea to, to look into someone when you're the one who did it. <laughs> yeah, I think this should be your lead. suggests you a specific other suspect, to draw attention away from them, they definitely did not do it. No. And, they, and people try to do that to Columbo all the time, and he never falls for it. He tells them he does. But do he... you remember, Brian, when we were kids and we were going to go rent a movie, and we had two video rental stores in, in my small town where I yeah. grew up? I had racked up a bunch of late fees at one. Of course. So my mom's like, hey, kids, you know, Brian's coming over for the weekend. Let, let's go rent a movies or games or whatever. And I had to subtly hint that we should go to the other place so my right. mom didn't so find out. So she wasn't aware of the late fees. How how uh, well did I do that, Brian? Oh, it was very under the radar. Definitely. No the, one could have guessed. No one could have guessed how you drew out the syllables of movie gallery. Uh, maybe, mom, we should go to movie gallery this <laughs> time and not video playhouse. <laughs> We did. We went to movie gallery. We did. I don't even think she understood that by you acting like a total weirdo repeatedly that you were insinuating we shouldn't go to Video Playhouse. I think she just thought you were being eccentric. She's Probably. like, this is par for the course. For this yeah, so exactly. Good. I also hope she really did say that. Hey, let's go rent some movies or games or whatever. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a line from the room or something. Yes. <laughs> I hope that happened. Uh, in this in this particular situation now, in, in our silk stockings world, we go to a strange bedroom because I don't know where this was at the time. I it's, don't either. It's still. time for softcore sex. Well, it's it's Helen's house, I think, right? Because mm -hmm. we we get uh, this is the only time we see Helen in her home. But all you know here is it's we we switch scenes and someone's fucking. So the woman who appears to be Helen, we don't know because we still have only seen her teeth, is is riding a man named Robert and calling him Jack. Oh, which is, and man. listening to Jack Fellman on the Talk, radio. Exactly. Which that, this is like, he is her life, I think. Oh, yeah. And Robert doesn't give a shit that she called him Jack, too. He's like, you know, he's like, who's Jack? I'm Robert. He doesn't mind. He just keeps kind of grabbing her. But that's it for her once he, I guess, ruined the fantasy or whatever it was. He broke the fourth wall. He broke kayfabe. What's she supposed to do? Yeah, she kicks him right out of there. He's gone. And he, he goes, you know, he doesn't really mind either way. I don't know how she met him, but she doesn't care about him. And he's pretty cool with it, too. So she kicks him out. She angrily lights up a cigarette. And that's that scene. It's just, um, I guess, we're setting the stage for how very much Helen likes Jack. And I guess maybe you might think she did do it. Yeah, and this is probably it, right? Like all these shows, usually the very first suspect you're presented with, that's the one who did it. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> it's Helen. Helen killed Carol. Do you Next guys episode. think that out there people like to listen to the Boob Two Boys and do it? I that would be kind of weird. I hope I hope not. I kind of hope they are doing that. Do you um do you think we're gonna get a stalker at some point? I could only hope so. <laughs> I hope it's a like a really silky one. Back at the radio station, we're going to get deeper into this and solve it eventually. So Chris and Rita are dropping in on Melissa. They're going to talk about whether or not Helen seems like a plausible target, and that's all they've got to go on right now, really. Melissa is the one actually speaking the voice of reason here. She doesn't think she's a likely candidate. She does seem weird when she calls, but she's saying, hey, she does that to everyone. She's got another person she calls and harasses. She's called me before on my show. She does that to everyone. She's harmless. Yeah, she fell in love with Danny, the late night guy. Yeah. Yeah, she does that with everyone. She's not a murderer. It's, 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 not, it's no big deal. While they're in there talking to Melissa, she gets a phone call alerting her that Jack is on the phone with Helen. I was kind of lost about how that happened. But the result is that Chris and Rita realize Helen's 
once again, she's on the prowl and she's on live air. They need to get the tracing. They, you know, they need to, they need to get the technology going here where they can figure out where she's calling from. Is My this whole favorite is. trope of all the oh, tropes yeah. is the keep her on the line. We've got to trace this call. And, I don't think that's how that works. And in the early 90s, what would it keep her on the line for 45 minutes? We've got to <laughs> yeah. trace this call. Yeah, and if if it if you fail for like even two seconds, that's it. The whole thing was a waste of time. You just talk to that person for nothing. So Jack does have those orders. He's doing his best to keep her going. She's being dramatic. She's making her very slow on-air confession while Jack keeps prompting her. It does end with, I killed Carol, Jack, which is kind of it reminded me of the Psy thing of the Jack thing. And I could picture Psy saying that. Like a, I killed Carol, Jack. <laughs> I've killed dozens, Jack. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so they've got the on-air confession and the trace is complete. This case is closed, if you ask me. Like, it's, yeah. all, it's all set. Yeah, this is over. You know how you really know? Is once once Helen officially says, I did it, Chris gives a thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they get to, Chris and Rita get to head over to Helen's house right away now that they've got the trace. Yeah, they've got their woman. They just need to ask a few more questions, wrap up loose ends, whatever. When they when they head over there, they I, I think there's like a brief knock and they go right in. It's They just kind of let themselves in Helen's house. There's no warrant or anything at this point. They just kind of go in. That's how we know we're not vampires. They just go in. They don't yeah, have to be invited. Yeah, that's true. That's that true. true. Which comes up again later. <laughs> no, <it doesn't. laughs> I, I like the idea of just implying oh, but, there's a vampire But twist. Bumpus isn't the head vampire. <laughs> <laughs> Bumpass. Sorry, I shouldn't call him by his actual name, which has got to be Bumpus. I'm certain. Is that better? <laughs> no. No, it sounds stupider. It Excuse does, me, actually. Mr. Bumpus. And then it feels like he should break out into song like a, like a children's character. <laughs> Bumpus, Bumpus, he's got <laughs> wonder, a rumpus. What a terrible name in general. I wonder what his middle name is. I kind of <laughs> want to figure this out now. Balloon. <laughs> <laughs> so after a short discussion with Helen talking about Jack, that she goes ahead and confesses in person, too, that she did kill Carol. Very nonchalantly. Yeah. she, she. I don't think she knows what she's getting herself into because they cuff her right there on the spot. Or as I put in my notes, they cuff her right up. <laughs> <laughs> well, she confesses right then and there to <laughs> Rob Estes, who is dressed like the mask. Uh, yeah, I also, th- and this is when they get in the station, I really noticed it. I, I had down that Chris is wearing a Dan Flashes shirt. Yes, yes, that's good. <laughs> yeah, is this the scene here where where Helen is very dismissive toward Rita, but yes. very warm yes. toward yeah. Chris. And she basically all but says, I'll only talk to you, Chris, because I would like sexy man. your chance to be on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Helen's got an agenda. And she's very rude to pretty much, you know, I, I presume all females. Interrogation time at the police station. Chris and Rita, they've got her in there. They're both playing bad cop because neither one of them is like buttering her up. They're both just <laughs> pressuring her. Which is kind of a meta commentary on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Helen doesn't seem perturbed. She just twirls her hair cluelessly. She insults Rita's shoes, muses about getting breast implants. <laughs> this whole scene you is know, All the stuff that happens during a murder interrogation. <laughs> but suddenly she does crack under pressure and admits she didn't kill Carol after all. <laughs> so that uh, she's totally fine with it. And all of a sudden she's like, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. All of what Spencer just described, Rita and Chris going over... To Helen's house, interviewing her, taking her this into all the station. This all happened in like 30 minutes. Yeah, and I think it even happened in 30 minutes in showtime, not even, yes. li- like, it, it all just happens, and then she just like, oops, didn't do it. it. It's very anticlimactic, like, they clearly, somebody told them they were going over time, and we need to shift into you another could, suspect. You could argue the pacing was a little awkward in this episode, for sure. Yeah. There was a lot of buildup in some parts, and then not that much at the end that you know, the big gotcha moment at the end is not not great either. So I'll just reveal that to the listener now. Is it's not the not the most exciting ending. So now that's a little bit that that throws a bit of a wrench in the investigation. They may not have their they may not have their killer after all. Outside the interrogation room, Chris rightfully questions Rita about the leading question because Rita does kind of prompt. She prompts Helen to say she didn't do it. Helen acts a little weird. She's like, because you didn't do it. So Chris does say like, hey, you know, nice job putting those words in her mouth. But then he ruins that by saying, is that some kind of a woman thing? (laughs) (laughs) The first of many of incidences of him doing the sexist bit. Although he does them in a dumb, innocent way. Yeah, he's clueless. Not excusing him, but it 
feels he's a not lot being malicious. It no. feels more like a Nerf ball hitting you after the repeated cannonballs hurled at you by Jack Felm and the radio DJ in terms of sexism. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's not. Yeah. He, I don't take it bad, but he certainly can be. Oh, yeah. Bumbly. No, he is boorish. But in the in the way that someone he's a sweet boorish man. <laughs> And the way that someone who still thinks they might play pro sports when they're 35 yeah. <laughs> would be boring. Yeah. So they're they're kind of out of leads now, right? So that's gonna that's gonna be tough for the episode. I guess we'll probably have to continue this in the next one. Oh no, Chris gets a call right away from from someone's friend, Barbara Dunham. She was uh let's I'm trying to I'm trying to remember this on the fly. Who was she a friend? She was a friend of Carol's. Yeah. So let's let's see. Which this surprised me too that they didn't get around to interviewing people who knew the deceased until now, other Maybe, than um, Jack Fellman, who ostensibly would have to be a suspect since he's the significant other of the victim. They didn't do a lot of background investigation, is what you're saying here. Yeah. I think you know what? Fuck it. I think you guys are right. I don't think Chris and Rita are great detectives. And correction, Spencer, they didn't do a lot of investigation. Just leave it at that. <laughs> oh, that's fair. That's totally fair. Thankfully, though, the, their investigation came to them because Barbara does call. She, does, she calls Chris and she says. <laughs> that didn't even occur to me. Yeah. They don't do anything no, to get the information never, they're about to get. Never. They, like, they only know about Helen because they're there when she calls. So all their leads are just stumbling upon them. <laughs> just accidental. So Chris has got a lead. Rita's decided she's going to go talk to Jack again, and they're going to go their separate ways so our plots can continue here. We're going to do Chris's plot first, and that's the art studio, where, oh boy. where we see a woman making a sculpture in the image of a nude model whose name is Cindy and who is sitting right there at the very front of the screen. Of course, we can't see anything suggestive, but we, well, we see something suggestive. We know she's naked, but it is, uh, this is CBS, so you can't see anything revealing. Chris presumably can and is immediately a little uh, excited and comfortable. He is so bewildered at yeah. the sight of a nude woman this that is... he can't function. Chris, who, again, at this point, I'm assuming is a man in his 30s, an adult man. Yeah. Who's a police officer living in, Early in Miami. Early seems like. Yeah. And, but he acts like a little boy who's never seen a nude woman before. He might as well have said a wooga and had his eyes like <laughs> snowball out of his face. The tongue rolls out yeah. to the floor. Yeah. You know what that could be? I, I don't know if you agree with this. That might have been kind of hazy acting directions and that he's not a very capable actor and didn't know how else to do it. You think that's possible? It's possible. It that's could true. also be possible that he read the script thought and for long, it. hard hours and was like, I'm going to nail this performance. What if it's and method it did. and they didn't tell him there was a nude woman in there? They're like, Rob, just and go in there. just how he is. Just just, walk yeah. in. And, that's, and that's how... <laughs> <laughs> and I, I like here, because Barbara's clearly kind of, she's a little annoyed and amused by that. She obviously feels the same way you do, Brian. It's kind of like, why are you acting that way? Yeah, she's like, I'm a sculptor. It's a human body, whatever. So okay. she gets, she's like, do you want to hand Cindy a towel or whatever, a robe? So she's like, I don't know why she has him do that, but he's, I guess maybe she's trying to keep him busy so he can recover. But, you know, the point is Cindy, Cindy gets the rope. She's out of the scene at this point. But we had to, we had to start with that so that we can see a There's little a bit. There's a joke about melons in here, of course. Oh, yeah, that's toward the end here. <laughs> and that, this, uh, this line of questioning, by the way, now that we have a little more insight into Chris, the line of questioning begins with Barbara rubbing the boob sculpture the whole time. She's continuing to... It, she is continuing to work on her piece of art here, and she's telling the story about how close she and Carol used to be before she met that arrogant Toad. And that's, that's of course, Jack Fellman. <laughs> that's, of course, Toad from the Mario series. Well, it, all, it puts him in good company. There's Slippy from Star Fox. <laughs> There's Toad from Frog and Toad. <laughs> All that's all. Do you, I don't know if any of those battle toads. How arrogant? Are, how arrogant can those really be? Toad from Mario seems like he's pretty humble. Toad the bounty hunter. <laughs> <laughs> it's his brain. <laughs> well, Jack, in any case, isn't it? It is his toad. brain. You can't take that off of his head, off Toad's <laughs> head, or you'll kill him. We learned that Jack, the arrogant Toad, tried to seduce Barbara after meeting her through Carol. And this is just something that he does. And Barbara knows that. She tried to tell Carol about it. Carol was like, oh, he was just messing around. And of course, Barbara says, I know the difference between messing around and messing around. I think it's just fooling, but yeah. something like that. Either way, we know. Carol One of those means fully penetrative sex. <laughs> so Barbara knows that Jack's a piece of shit. And she really wants to make sure that the police know this, too. They've got to let Sting in on it. This whole story happens. Like Carol did eventually find out that Jack is like that, although she wouldn't believe the Barbara story. She does learn eventually that 
He does do that. And he admits it and actually breaks up with her at that point when she catches him cheating. He says, yeah, you're right. I just like to fuck strangers. Get out of my life. So she's devastated. She gave him seven good years. I said that on purpose. I wasted seven <laughs> years on you. Lot, you. We've we've had a lot of accidental room coincidences. And the one Duck Dynasty thing. I killed yeah. Carol, Jack. So we, we learned that Carol's devastated because of all this time she spent with Jack and he just kicks her out because he likes to fuck other people. Barbara's very mad on Carol's behalf because she doesn't feel like Jack was anything. She hadn't ac- he hadn't accomplished shit before he met Barbara. And now he's going national. He's a big deal. And he was gonna, he's going to get all the success and then dump Carol to the side. So what she's saying is, you know what? Here's the motive. She was going to a fancy pants lawyer and she was, she got plans to get half of everything. Now, I do have to wonder, can you do that when they hadn't gotten married yet? Because Jack specifically says in the first scene we were going to get married. So how is she going to get half of everything? I, the only thing I could think is if they had some sort of unspoken, in the script, agreement financially. <laughs> Because, yeah, yeah. If you're yeah. not and they married, didn't talk about maybe that they were like working together in some form. I don't know, but I really yeah. There that was an implication me. that Carol had an impact on the show. Barb gives yes, but so, we don't have indication of what that. Impact I don't feel was. that was even made clear. Was she the one that was like? Was it before Carol was Jack a really good guy? Yeah, who gave advice? He was he a Frasier type on the <laughs> air who suddenly just started saying boobs a lot. <laughs> Just put in some awooga noises and say tits, and then you'll have a great audience. <laughs> and well, then eventually you'll murder me. There's only probably so much sense we're going to be able to figure out that, but I just, I wanted to point out that little plot line was a little strange. The point is right now, though, we've got the motive, and that's a huge thing. You can't ask Columbo. I'm sorry, I keep bringing that up. He's but big on motive. He would, um, he would like that, because that's important. They've got the motive in place, and Chris is definitely going to be able to use that for something. At the radio station, Rita is going a little more into the details with Jack and getting into the situation with Carol. And he says, yeah, you know, they had problems. They're writing up probably the biggest escalator I've ever seen as they're talking in this in this Best scene. place to conduct a police interview on a moving escalator. Yeah, it's just, it's so, so impossible. Plus, tall. you can get dipping dots when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so, she, and Jack, Jack's kind of just saying like, you know, we were going to work through all that stuff. It's no big deal. And then that's where Rita hits him with the, well, you know what? Barbara told Chris that you guys were having trouble and she was going to take half of everything. Yeah, she was going to dump ass bump ass. <laughs> <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> yeah, Jackson, Jackson eyes everything. He's like, no, that's that's not true. We were fine and, you know, she wasn't going to, I had no motive to kill her and the next bombshell that Rita has is Helen recanted her confession. She doesn't you know, you you don't have anything at all here, Jack. You're in trouble. So now he goes into a big victim card rant and says, you know what? I I didn't do anything wrong. I'm just an innocent person here being assaulted. Uh, I you, you talk to my lawyer from now on. We're not going to talk person to person anymore. He goes from pal to irate scamp like that, just yeah. instantly. Just he, like how he went from a grieving, essentially widower to, hey, Rita, what are you doing tonight? And about <laughs> five seconds earlier. Yeah, there's a lot of emotional shifts in the show, and they're usually, they're very sudden. Back at the police station where Helen's still being held, despite the fact that they're pretty sure she didn't do it at this point, it's time for Jack to pay a visit. He is angry. He makes her repeat that she killed Carol because obviously he's learned that she took that back now. And once she does, he proceeds to call her a vile murdering bitch. He then speaks to her in a strange demonic voice and says a whole bunch of horrible things, presumably like the worst thing she'd ever want to hear. You get out of prison, you're going to be so old and fat and ugly that my Marmaduke will always love me. <laughs> After this total outburst, the guards pull her away. She's hysterical, as you can tell. And Jack smugly reveals the tape recorder he had in his pocket the whole time while she redid her confession, essentially. I'm going to point out that this police precinct has their very own Hannibal Lecter room. Like a, yeah. It's like a little booth she's got. Yeah, I, don't I thought think, she might record vocals. I don't <laughs> think you, yeah, that's not where you meet people when you go into jail. No, <laughs> like floor to ceiling gl- glass, <laughs> like bulletproof glass between Jack and, <laughs> and uh, what the hell's her name? Helen at this point. <laughs> There's so also, many names. courtesy to the warden or whoever went to Spirit Halloween and got all those <laughs> lights to put up before this meeting. Yeah. What is the deal too with that, with that weird uh, fat? 
<laughs> and is his face changing as he says it? Is that is that how Helen sees it? Or? I think so, because it's very clear she's mentally yeah. Yeah. unstable. So she has some mental problems. And, you know, from 2021 mindset, we can be like, oh, we should have gotten her the help. But considering this is the 90s, that it's like, nah, she was crazy. So whatever, whatever yeah. happens, was fine. Right, exactly. Which is kind of the 1990s stance on anyone who just wasn't naturally fine. Mm-hmm. And you could see that Jack is very sensitive to the triggers that would probably send her into hysterics like that, as that, you know, he used all of them and threw them in her face. Yes. Oh, and it's, you know, not any scarier than his normal look. I'm going to no. point that out there. It's just red tinted. Or his, his normal case. voice. Yeah. <laughs> SpongeBob, get back to the crammy <laughs> patty. SpongeBob, I'm sick of you walking around here half naked with your starfish hanging out. I would like to, for him to do an entire radio show in the demon voice, personally. <laughs> that would be, that'd be fantastic. So he... It's Saturday drive time with <laughs> Satan. Lunchtime with Lucifer. Jack looks like he's got a... Jack looks like he's got Breakfast a plan with here. with Beelzebub. Okay, I'm done. No, it's... That's fine. These are good. These are, these are good little segments that radio shows should consider. So it does look like Jack has a plan here to get back and get the, get the attention back on Helen. And we're going to figure out if it's going to work because we go back to the police station where Chris and Reed are outside talking about Helen. Oh, boy, this bit. The, his little bit is fairly troublesome. Yeah, and, and what he's saying here is like I talked to Melissa and she's going to take Helen on as a patient. They, she's, she needs the help and we can get that to her. We should let her go. So Sergeant Donovan just happens to be walking by at the time. That's really convenient because they can besiege him to release her because they have nothing on her. And, you know, that's just, let's just let her go. There's no reason to, there's no reason to hold her anymore. Donovan kind of just goes, I don't know much about Donovan. He's only in a little bit of these and he just kind of has little, little bit. Let's move the plot line parts, but his first name is probably MacGuffin. (laughs) Yeah. He's just, uh, he's a big kind of dorky guy. And he says, yeah, you know. Go ahead and let her go, but you know, let's let's make sure this doesn't fall back on us. And then he has this uh, this really clever headline idea that if it gets, if it goes if it goes against him, this is what the world will see in the paper in the morning. All right, let her walk. Just make sure she doesn't go anywhere. I can just see the headlines now. DA releases confessed murderer. Very to the point. Very dry and black and white headline there. That's a sensationalist tabloid headline for sure there, Donovan. <laughs> okay, it didn't actually really occur to me until now that that's like his, I can just see it now in stars. That's how thing I Thing happened. It. <laughs> <laughs> Very down the middle headline that you would actually see in the paper. Bank robber robs bank. <laughs> Oh, we don't want that headline getting out there. How salacious. I, I couldn't help but put that down because that's the most unimaginative headline ever for like, oh, we don't, <laughs> if this spills out, it'll say this. The writing staff totally had the brackets right there that said, like, think of something later. <laughs> and <laughs> and they didn't, didn't. Yeah. at all. And he read it like it was a big headline, like <laughs> DA releases confessed murder. It's just, I couldn't help it. Now they go inside to release Helen, but it's too late. She's well, already. Hang, hang on, let me. I just want to point out when I said earlier his troublesome bit. That wasn't that he wanted to get help. No, for, no, for... Van. This is this is <laughs> canon on the podcast. Van hates it when people are undergoing trauma and, and get help <laughs> and get help. Yeah. No. What annoyed me about this is he tells a story about. Norma the Nympho, I believe is what he called her. And essentially- That's not her legal name. Not at all. And he went to high school with this girl and he's like, yeah, the football team and me, we Uh all had it. Now I see what you're talking about. And, you know, I just just finally realized she just wanted love. And what it amounts to, what it equates to is that thing that annoys the hell out of me is when, for example, this often comes up in, in women's rights and stuff where they'll be like, until I had a daughter, I just didn't understand it. It's like, are you that out of empathy yeah. that you can't understand it until you have a vested Until my interest? daughter was born, I didn't know that I wasn't supposed to violate the rights of another human being. And it's you another didn't? reason why I couldn't stand fucking this Chris guy. <laughs> yeah. And this is another, kind of to my point earlier, the show wants us to like Chris, so they have him wanting to help Helen. Yes. And doing so in such a misguided way. He's just aloof. And, and, and I thought that's yeah. actually I thought that's what you meant when you said that, you know, the, the part about Helen, the way he approaches her needing help is not exactly very forward thinking. No, no. So I thought that's what you but meant. But he got there. Sure. I'll give him that. Yeah. I, I didn't take that as that. you. Yeah. At you least he saying. wasn't doing whatever he was doing to Norma. <laughs> yeah. The the key is that they it seems as though things were going to be OK for Helen because they, they had realized that there is yeah. something that they could be that could be done for it. Cool. Well, it, things are going to be great from here. Yeah, on. Yeah, man. They've got it figured out. Oh, it's too late. Helen hung herself. Oh, shit. 
<laughs> I think I missed this part. <laughs> <laughs> you thought, did you watch the alternate ending where she was getting help from? Yeah, Martha? it was. I did that. Did you not do choose your own adventure silk stockings? <laughs> I wish that would be great. So now we're at the funeral <laughs> because uh, Helen did hang herself. I assume it's a funeral because Chris and Melissa are there and it's, there's a coffin. No one else is there. It's just those two that come up and they're talking near Helen's coffin. So they're hypothesizing about why someone who just wants love and attention would take their own life. And Chris wonders if she thought someone might have rescued her. Someone might have saved her from it. And that's that. I mean, that's the funeral. No one came. No one's no one's oh, sure why she sad. killed herself. We kind of find out more of what we suspected, that Helen's a very lonely person. And that's why she was calling into the radio station for attention from Jack, the worst person. Was that a funeral? It was, by the way, at a synagogue, I believe. There was the uh, Star of David on the outside of the mm. building. I believe it was at the funeral because at one point they mentioned, like, no one came to visit her here yeah. at the funeral. And initially, I thought they were talking about a prison. I was like, if one of you commits murder, I'm probably not going to come I wouldn't you. want you to. No, I least... think it'd be, I'd want to, I'd have a lot of questions. Yeah, that's true. I'd be like, what the fuck were you doing, First Brian? off, I'd be like, what? No, no see, I I'm... don't think so. From the would person be my on first... the- Not because I wouldn't think you're <laughs> evil. You're, por- you're, you're totally evil. But because I, how physically would you have carried well, out a murder? Well, you might have poisoned them with ice cubes. Poisoned with <laughs> ice cubes. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm listening. I might did... have tossed some coins out a window. <laughs> <laughs> I can see you being a poisoner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I wasn't sure if it was a funeral, because I, I don't even know where the person who, you know, put her in the, in the casket and all that was. It was just, it's just Chris and Melissa in like a dark room. So that was kind of weird. They, uh, they, the big thing there is, yeah, you're supposed to kind of, they're they're trying to piece together like why would she do that? Maybe they're at the morgue or something. Yeah, I don't, the, I don't know the synagogue morgue. <laughs> the point religious is religious Hel- morgue. Helen's dead and she's in a coffin and they don't know why. They don't know why she would do that. So Melissa offers Chris a ride and on the way and they tune to Jack's latest show. He's thrilled Helen is dead. Jack is on the radio all the time. Doesn't matter what <laughs> you, when you, you just turn on the radio. Flip the dial on and Jack's and Jack's doing his stuff. He's thrilled Helen's dead. Takes a shot at the police department. Plays the tape he recorded over the air, which I'm. I'm sure that would be legal that the confession he got out of her himself in a private in a private visit with her is now going to again prove she's the murderer. It'll hold up in court. Jack is obsessed with videotapes and recorded confessions. So it looks like Jack is determined to completely finish burying Helen and making sure that she comes away looking like a kind of a kind of a crazy person who is probably a murderer. And Donovan at the police station doesn't see what can be done. You know, the, no. tape, the tape proves her guilt, and so does her suicide. And it's just, that's, that's just that. It's over. Jack must have won against the cops. Well, Chris is determined, because he knows there's only one thing he can do now, and that's punch a hole in Jack's alibi. So if he's thinking, what if it was a professional killing? Just because he was at the station doesn't mean he didn't, doesn't mean he didn't do it. He might have hired him. Rita's like, no, that, that's not a professional killing. I One think. behind the ear, man. That's how the pro. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be so sloppy if it was a pro yeah, that's dog. Yeah, that's the word she uses. It's, it's too sloppy. You know, and, and so Chris is like, maybe he wasn't really at the studio then. And Rita's like, no, the engineer Billy. Yeah, that's impossible. Engineer Billy said he was there. Chris is still not satisfied. He's, he, he's not letting go. To his credit, he's very determined in these situations. So we're back at the radio station where Chris is going to... He's going to really get into Billy here and figure out if maybe Billy's making shit up, except that he really doesn't. He just kind of <laughs> goes after him immediately. He tosses him a few softball questions about Jack, like, huh, how long you guys been working together? Oh, yeah. Do you, you keep all the tapes back there? Hey, you tell me why you're covering for him. That's essentially how it comes <laughs> across. Like he's asking him a few questions and then suddenly starts screaming at him. And he's right up on him, <laughs> like inches from his face. After, this is the aspect ratio thing you mentioned mm-hmm. earlier, Van. After talking to him very calmly from a distance and then he leans in and, and we get a little bit of a semi threat from him in his anger state. You and Jack are going national, huh? It's a big move. He taking you along for the ride? Yeah, he's taking me with him. It's all of me and Jack. We're a team. Accessory to murder is a long drop down a dark hole. You ready to make that ride with him? Look, I don't know what you're talking about. Jack didn't do anything. You know what Jack did. So do I. You might want to think about changing teams, Billy. So he puts a good scare in him there, and it sees himself out. Please stop asking me about taking rides. You did it (laughs) several times. Over and over. Do you have another metaphor? (laughs) (laughs) Or what are you, Nelly? (laughs) <laughs> is that right yeah okay good <laughs> yeah he yeah. asked if you if you want to take a ride with him i think yeah did quite, you like did you what, guys ever do that ago? with nelly no i sure didn't 
He's from St. Louis, you know. He's not he's not far. I once went to a Cardinals game that they they were doing Nelly Night on. That Nelly is Knight. true. I forgot about Nelly. Nelly Night, it was a big deal. It was like a Tuesday. <laughs> he didn't deserve a weekend game. Oh, Tuesday might be Nelly's favorite day. Yeah, we don't we don't know that much about Nelly on this podcast. Good. <laughs> we know what he likes to do when it gets hot in here. <laughs> Uh, is that what the people at, that Silk Stockings characters like to do? That <laughs> yes, same exact it is. thing? So, oh man, this fits in perfectly because we're going to Rita's house and she's not wearing a whole lot here. She's sleeping. It's the middle of the night. It's 4.30. She doesn't know how a bed works. I'll give no. her that. No, well, you know, she kind of is a strange sleeper. She's sleeping next to like a half-eaten oatmeal cream pie. She's on top <laughs> of her covers. She's not, she just kind of splayed out. It looks like she was eating the cream pie and then fell asleep. She looks like she <laughs> fell asleep imitating the chalk outline of a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> the cream pie thing was my favorite part because it was, it's such a, like a Katie thing to do. Fall asleep eating an oatmeal cream that. pie. That is so weird. And I, I noticed it right away and I like that they actually had her continue eating yeah, it. Yeah, so she wakes up, she's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> chomp, I, chomp, chomp. I thought, it was yeah, just bonus. A set, I thought it was a set piece, but then, you know, she picks up the phone when Chris calls her and starts eating and I was like, okay, that's pretty cool. <laughs> now this scene is fascinating. It's very short. It's just Rita and Chris talking in the phone, but it's so fascinating from so many levels. It's disturbing too, because basically there's a little theme here. They keep referencing her little buns and and Chris tells her to come in. She finally agrees after they talk about her little buns a little more. And the call ends and him making a kissing sound through the phone receiver. So she's at 430 in the morning, waking up, getting a call about her little buns and then going to meet him. The whole thing was just this must be important. It tells a lot about their relationship. But yeah, Chris is clearly working on something. She's maybe not as far along in this case as Chris is at this point, because she seems to mostly be kind of saying what Donovan's saying. This thing's over. There's not much we can do. But Chris is keeping it going. He's got an idea. He wants her to meet him at the radio station. Also, at some point in this conversation, and this isn't important except for Devan, Rita says the word else, as in something else. else. And she says else. Else. I, right. know, I know is a big, mm -hmm. a big uh, pet peeve of yours. Absolutely. Man. Yeah. And, well, here's the thing, though, about Rita is after watching these two episodes, I feel she's a human, like a normal, yeah. intelligent human. Her and Chris both, right? Not so much, Chris. Oh, weird. Every other character that is introduced in this show has their quirks and their wacky bullshit, but she's very even killed. I liked Rita. No, Rita I, I think is she's easily very likable. Easily the most likable character in and Silk she's Stockings. definitely the best written period. Like, yeah. I mean, it's just it's it's not just that she's likable; it's that they well, actually this episode, fleshed her out okay. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I don't I don't know a whole lot about Rita. I can't be a total Rita expert, but I thought she was. I thought she was, you know, okay, fine, it's just the oatmeal cream pie. The fact that she <laughs> woke up and ate that, that won me over right there. So Chris has got something big planned. They have to meet at the radio station to do this. And this is Chris's big plan in uh, not just this episode, but he needs to, he Seemingly needs Seemingly yeah. every episode. Chris is a transit <laughs> Is that how he solves every crime? Granted, I, I'll bring up Columbo again. He does this a lot. He doesn't use it as the closing thing to the whole case. But he will he will see if someone's lying based on distances between driving. Yeah, time logistics. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, Chris is really determined to try this out. Like I just now thought of this thing. We could actually test drive times. I, I'm, I'm just now thinking of this and I'm going to do it every episode. <laughs> <laughs> so he's going back and forth between Jack's apartment and the radio station to see is there any way now that, you know, he does realize that's another thing when he visits Billy. He sees that he holds old tapes. So they could have put something on the air. As long as he got back in time to do the news, they could have put something on the air. He, he could have left, shot Carol, and come back. So he's testing that in the traffic, and it's not working. The time's not adding up. It's 33 minutes, and it's supposed to be 30. So it's just a little over. It doesn't quite work. Rita's there to time him. I don't really know why he needed her. He could have let her sleep. It was 4.30 in the morning, and she, you know, she, she just got I would imagine timing's a two-person job in 1990-whatever. Well, <laughs> she's sitting there with a the stopwatch at the other place. We know Chris is incapable of doing two things at once, so <laughs> driving and, tie and holding a stopwatch, <laughs> too much. That was nice of, of Rita to get up at 4.30 in the morning and leave that oatmeal cream pie for Chris, is I'd all I'm saying. I'd be so mad if Chris <laughs> did that to me. <laughs> I mean, a you star really crunch would, fine, but an oatmeal sure. cream pie? What do you think about a cosmic brownie? Would you do it for that? I like those things. I don't even know why. Not that big of a brownie person, really. But I mean, I, I I wouldn't turn it down. I'm a bigger fan of a Star Crunch than an oatmeal cream pie. Star either. Crunch is something about those things. The mm. Rice Krispies. No, I like them too. I like all this shit. We like candy. Yeah. We're gross. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris is determined, though, that despite the fact that this isn't quite working, he's not ready to give up. He believes Billy's in on it and he knows they pulled it off somehow. So 
good timing here for him to feel so so convinced that this happened and who better to who better to talk to about his feelings his convictions than jack himself who's pulling in for his day of work because you know they've been doing this thing for hours and now it's like eight and ready to start the day at the radio station so Jack pulls in. They in get his into convertible, it. which is the most fitting vehicle. Oh yeah, they for this get, guy. They he's so him. smug. He's so smug all the time, and especially in the scene, and he's he's happy to see him. By that I mean he's got lots of nasty things to say to him. The insults go back and forth. Things are really heating he up. calls Rita a little piece. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's a there's a whole thing that they do here, and I I I've got a little bit of it set up for you guys here. You're not gonna get away with this. <sighs> you sound like a bad movie. Hey, you know I got an idea. Tomorrow, when I go national, I'm going to institute the Bozo of the Day Award. And I'm going to give it to the biggest fool I can find. And I'm going to call it the Lorenzo. It's got a nice ring to it, don't you think? Well, let's go. No matter how long it takes me, I'm going to nail you. What, are you threatening me, detective? That's, uh, that was so intense. And I want to talk more about this. Let's take a short break, though. And unless you're a Bozo, you'll stick with <laughs> us and be here on the other side of it. Chris loses his cool, of course, because, you know, and it does get worse, granted, but he falls for it pretty easily. Jack knows what he's doing. He does mention something about, he says, Helen's crazy, but she was sexy. Are you fucking Rita too? Something like that. So he baits Chris. Chris pushes him against a car and Jack's got a, he's got a lawsuit he's threatening and something about a restraining order is going to happen. Who knows? Chris is the easiest person to fool. (laughs) Yeah, I don't, it doesn't take a whole lot. His buttons are real easy to push. Mm-hmm. At the police station, Chris is insisting Rita shouldn't be mad at what he did. He was only defending her honor after all, which was kind of funny. He's back to his like little boy thing at this uh-huh. point where he just seems like, uh, well, what's wrong with what I did? And she's saying, you know, I can fight my own battles while she's cramming a donut in her face. Do you want to see my new Tonka truck? <laughs> what else does, uh, does Chris think about in this scenario? Something that Jack Fellman said to him. Hmm. The only thing Chris can think about is Rita. If that did happen, would you just scream my name? <laughs> Detective oh. fucking creep is what I wrote down here. I wrote down, cops discuss lawsuit. Chris asks Rita if she'd scream if they boned. <laughs> <laughs> well, keep in mind, you know, they're only a few years away from getting married. So this is all working for her. And him dying. And she, <laughs> and she does. She does shove. A, I don't know if it's the same donut, but she just she responds to his question by shoving a donut in his mouth is all I know. I mean, that would work on me. A woman came up and shoved a donut in my mouth. I'd be like, I love you forever. <laughs> you guys ready for some more Sergeant Donovan? Because he's coming back into this What's scene, that? Bro. I'm needed again? I waited for him to like fall down a manhole or trip <laughs> and get his hand stuck in a toaster. Like he's just kind of a bumbling. <laughs> he really is. He enters the room clapping. He's so proud that Chris made such an ass of himself. Although he does say, Personally, I'm glad you did it, but yeah, that's a big deal. You're fucked. You're going to get in trouble. You need to get your statement ready. But like I said at the beginning, man's got to be a man, and that means an attack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it also reminds him, don't forget, this case is closed. Chris is doing all this because he can't let it go, but this Seems case is closed. Seems hopeless now, guys. Yeah, it is. It's definitely hopeless. Chris doesn't, uh, he's not ever going to believe that because he is talking now to Melissa at a swimming pool, apparently. that's They met for an outdoor chat. I don't know why. Another staple of Silk Stockings, meetings at swimming pools. Well, it is Palm Beach. I guess they want to... That's true. Although I guess they shot this in San Diego mostly. Mm. So either way, it's tropical looking. She's wearing, by the way, a Wonder Woman like corset and the highest mom jeans you've ever (laughs) seen in your life. They're just up to her like armpits. (laughs) Uh, Melissa's actually trying to talk sense into Chris here. That's what happens a lot in the show. She's telling him, look, Jack just wants an apology. He'll drop the suit. That's it's not that big a deal. Look, if you don't quit this, I'm only going to be in six or seven episodes <laughs> of this series. And it, Chris is not going for even that. He won't he won't take any easy out. And he's like, you know what? Surely, you know, something else you haven't told me about him. There's got to be some way. There's got to be get something him. cooler about him. There's got to be there's got to be something we can do here. And Melissa's like, well, he drives a motorcycle. (laughs) And I mean, there's a few things before that, but that's how it ends, essentially, is what the scene is. And then they might as well have just had a cartoon light bulb appear above Chris's head. He's like, wait a minute. Motorcycles are faster than cars. That's going to change the whole thing he just spent hours working on. (laughs) Now I get to time myself again. (laughs) He'll have to call Rita at 430 so she can (laughs) meet him. I'm going to wait till the middle of the night and I'm going to call Rita again. 
Uh, so we go back to the radio station now that we've got this big bombshell. Chris is waiting with Sam. I, I, I wrote Sam at that point because she he calls her that, and I thought that was her name. He does that a lot. And That's I, a I nickname, didn't, I guess. Which, uh, yeah, because Sam's short for Rita. It, it threw me off. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, there is, it is a nickname, but... Uh, <laughs> They call each other that because they have some uh, they have some character that they both love or personality, some celebrity they both love named Sam. Sam Kennison, so, probably. What so was they that call old each other Sam. detective game with the dog and the bunny? Sam and Max. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I was really Could thrown that. There. Maybe it's that. Yeah. I'll Maybe they're goofus and gallant. I'll read that No, again. no, because one of them would have to be Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so at the radio station, Chris is all excited with this news. He's waiting with Rita as Jack enters. More insults are traded. Jack is very smug and confident as usual. This, is, this isn't this is anything new here. There's a nice callback to the opening scene, though. They do a, the radio voiceover again with on-screen action, except this time, this time Chris is testing out the trip on a motorcycle. Yeah, and this whole scene fucking rules. Um, real quick, before we get into the specifics of this scene, I wanted to point out that Jack could not possibly be acting less like someone who's, like, fiance of seven years was just murdered <laughs> uh-huh that was the thing that that i found really amazing is he has shifted so far from the point of the original like you might as well just be able to arrest him on that the yeah. pretense is gone <laughs> yeah no he's been just working on being an asshole to them for at this point most of the episode that's been most yeah. of his, most of his shtick that and getting helen to hang herself has largely been what he's <laughs> contributed here so very dedicated chris he's he's gonna get this he's gonna get this to work out he actually he acts the whole thing out. He goes into the apartment and pantomimes taking the shot. <laughs> this is my favorite part of either episode. It's my favorite thing. He first off, he ramps a bunch of curbs in the motorcycle. Like, for, would the radio show host be doing that in midday <laughs> during his radio? He ramps a bunch of curbs, breaks into the house where Carol was killed, pantomimes the gun, and says out loud, "Bang bang, you're dead." <laughs> yes. Before leaving. This is all part of the practice run. He's got to make sure it's right. It's so great. When he gets back this time, it's 27 minutes. They have him. That's all, that's all they needed was that Chris could do the drive in 27 minutes. And That'll hold up in closed. court. And that's even with stopping to paint a mime the gun and <laughs> saying, bang, bang, you're dead. So, of course, the best way to reveal this is during an in-studio appearance where they announce to all his listeners that he's under arrest. Yeah, and this is his first day going national. Yeah, he's got his big opening going. He's talking about some woman's boobs on his, on his, she's yelling at him. He's like, you know, just one last thing before you go. What do you look like naked or something like that? He's being his usual self. He's excited that he's national. And he then, also is being really progressive again, trying to decriminalize sex work. And also he he talks an awful lot about police brutality and yeah, stepping their bounds. Yeah, he talks about a oh, yeah. police brutality and decriminalizing sex work. So, again, being very progressive, but we're supposed to think he's bad. <laughs> and also, yeah, that that police brutality thing comes up here because Chris and Rita enter the room and they're Jack's thinking, yeah, they're going to they're going to apologize on air. I've got them. And he, he's so excited to see him and he gets ready. He preps his audience. He's like, you know, for anyone who's ever been wronged by a cop, you're going to love this next thing. So that he, this is about the best day of his career at this point until they do sit down and indeed arrest him on air. So Chris is telling him all the ways they got him. A janitor's going to vouch that he saw him leave that day on his motorcycle. The I, cops, that, that little deus ex machina. I threw that in there. Yeah. Did you guys like how Chris very carefully adjusts his microphone before saying you're under arrest? Oh, yeah. And he does. He pauses dramatically, too. He's like, so you, you have something to say to me, right, Chris? And he's like, yes, I do. <laughs> you're under arrest. It's it's just Chris is being <clears throat> his Four best. score and seven. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they've got the janitor vouching for him. The cops are already going to they're already in the process of breaking down Billy. Jack can see everywhere he looks, the world's crumbling around him. The case is closed for real this time. That's true. You can't poke holes in this thing. In fact, Chris says to Jack, your plan has a hole in it. A hole big enough to drive a motorcycle through. As he pulls up the helmet and puts it and on the hands table. It and then hands him the helmet. It's Oh, it's amazing. Again, that's that's what really cinched this deal. That's is the, the motorcycle. gavel hitting the table. <laughs> And the fact that Chris drove that himself. He drove the motorcycle there and knows for sure. That's the, it's, he evil can evil his way back and forth. It's, it's now legally binding. So to celebrate in the end of the episode, we've got Rita and Chris in a dark stairwell looking area. I couldn't really figure out where they were, but they're kind of, they're alone. They're pushed against a wall and they're eating pizza. She shoves one in his face just like she did the donut. I guess he likes that. He's nice, into it. A nice partner bond moment. The end. And what he does say that I want to point out is that he's like, I, I, I hate to think that 
you know, there's aliens out there in space and, you know, radio just goes forever. So I, these aliens are hearing Jack and they're thinking that's what humans are. So my final question to you gentlemen is, do you think that Boob Two Boys is being beamed far out into space and there's some alien out there listening like, God, this planet fucking sucks. Yeah, our Neptune listenership has gone way up in the last week. <laughs> I don't know why. I mean, I hope that if that is the case, that aliens also understand that not everything we do is necessarily a show we like or that they think we were just the worst. Of yeah, humans. we're a varied lot human beings. I Oh, I, um, I don't know if you guys know this, but actually Earth isn't even our biggest audience planet. It's Melmac. <laughs> no, see, I did <laughs> know sense. that. That's, yeah. that's old news. We've already covered that at the previous <laughs> points. You guys have any thoughts about this one before we, we do wrap Ooh. it up? We've got a we got another one that's uh, it's also wild. That's okay. It's more wild. It always happens this way. We've got, I just want to say Tim Thomerson in the next one. We sure do. <laughs> oh yeah, boy, do we. Uh, silk <laughs> he's stockings. not little either. He's real big. He's more <laughs> he's more Jack Death than he is Dollman. <laughs> yeah, certainly in this case, I think Silk Stockings was complete. Not completely. It was far different than I anticipated because it was so much stupider and cooler in that regard. Uh, yeah, very yeah. goofy. I thought it was more procedural. With some light nudity. That's what I thought it would be. But this was... Well, you got the second part right. Yes. This was just very Renegade-like or very Walker-like. Just that batshit crazy 90s feel. I, I really... Yeah, I don't think it was as bad as Renegade or Walker. But it had the... It had like a very dumb aspect to it for sure. Yeah, it's it's super stupid. Which I thought it would be probably. But I didn't know it would be to this degree. But it is a lot of fun to watch and moves really fast. Certainly not as adult as I thought it was either as a kid. I mean, I was busy watching like Bret Hart fight Shawn Michaels and <laughs> assuming that afterwards there were probably just boobs upon boobs. And there are, they're just mostly obscured. Well, we might come back to this one next week when we compare and contrast at the end when they do our look back on it. But that's going to that's gonna cover it for this time. We're going to come back with more self stalking next week, as I yeah. mentioned. That's that's all for this week, though. We want to well, thank you. Well, not exactly. You are, you're, you're, are you trying to take my show? What is this? Yeah, it's, uh, we're not exactly done here because we've, we've talked a lot of trash on Silk Stockings lately and I, and a lot of shows, you know, and I don't want to be wholly negative and I want to highlight. Okay. Some, I like this. Some of the positive things that we see when we do Boob Tube Boys, because I don't know if we spend enough time on that. So without further ado, I would like to present the first edition of a tribute to the actor. Yes, gentlemen and audience, it is time for the first edition, the inaugural edition, if you will, of a tribute to the actor, Nick Tate. <laughs> Tate was born June 18th, 1942 in South New South Wales, Australia. He first rose to prominence, appearing in 42 episodes of Space 1999 in the 1970s. Tate starred alongside Mission Impossible actors Martin Landau and wow. Barbara Bain in the show, which tracked the crew of Moonbase Alpha after a large explosion. <laughs> Tate would go on to be featured in the Australian soap opera Sons and Daughters, likely due to his untamable sex appeal. No, not even a role in the pirate and gross blue food fantasy movie Hook could prepare Tate for the role of his or any other actor's lifetime, the single appearance portrayal of Martin Avis Hominus Chesterfield in the weekly Western series, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. Wow fully embodying the spirit of a man who came to believe that he is a bird. Tate chirped and crashed his way into our hearts <laughs> and hearts worldwide in the season six episode fittingly titled Birdman. Well, Tate wait, was, wait, it was about him it being was about a bird him the whole man? Time. Yeah, he thought he was a bird. I know it's fucking crazy. Finally, we got to the bottom yeah, of what it's, Birdman I've been thinking I've been really stewing on it all week. Well, Tate was not given any official awards for his performance. <laughs> His work lives on in the hearts of those he inspired and in the work of this very podcast. This has been the first edition of A Tribute to the Actor. Very good. Oh, that was unexpected. Just got to keep things positive around here, guys. Oh, Martin. When someone really makes an impact on me, I like to let them know. Is he the most impactful character in Boob 2 Boys Nick history Tate? now? I think he... So far. I, I think so. so. Far. If I not, agree. he... I mean, he has to be, though. And he's still alive, Nick Tate, the actor. Yes. Yes. Good for him. Is he still acting? Uh, I don't think so. He's you in his 80s. Think. 
They're, yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to guess now. Barbara Bain is in her I, nice. uh Earlier today, I was thinking what would be really cool is to, like, if we could interview him somehow. Oh, yeah. oh man. So I looked out my window to the nearest tree, and I yelled up at the nest I saw. Did he respond? <laughs> no, he wasn't there. <laughs> Okay, Spencer, I'm done. No, what you you did that, and now you get to you get to talk us out here. Okay, well, Let's see if you can after that. Well, we've already discussed earlier. We've done it all. We just uh, we just need to tell them where they can find. Tell the nice people where to find it. Yeah, we've discussed. Uh, you can find us on. You know where you can find him. <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> oh man, that was. Oh, that was well, just sitting right there. I didn't see it. I he, didn't see it. He might be migrating right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> You can find, I mentioned this earlier, but the podcast is on Twitter and Instagram, at BoobTubeBoys. You can find us individually on Twitter. I am at Loud Guitar Brian Ben. I'm, uh, I'm going to go next. Don't, I'm, sorry. Oh, I'm, I'm going to talk over him. No, you don't do it. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Where? No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. I'm at the number I'm three. I'm at Manly Lee. <laughs> I'm at the number three French underscore hen. Oh, and uh, give us some money. Go to Patreon.com <laughs> forward slash BooTube. You can also and, uh, find the link on boobtubeboys.com and we are also on Twitter, Instagram, and all you know, every social media platform you can think of, we're there, or we will be. And we will never be on YouTube. We'll see you next week. Bye.